Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. So thank you all for joining us here this afternoon. Um, we have a very distinguished speaker with us this afternoon as part of the W.L. Mellon Speaker Series. We have Mr. James, James Rohr here with us this afternoon. Um, just a little bit about himself. Um, he is currently the chairman and CEO of the PNC Financial Services Group, which is headquartered here in Pittsburgh. He's very involved in PNC as a firm, as well as here in the Pittsburgh philanthropic scene. And Mr. Rohr attended the University of Notre Dame, where he obtained his Bachelor of Arts degree, and he proceeded to obtain his MBA from the Ohio State University. And upon graduating, he joined PNC in the Management Development Program, where he proceeded to hold several positions in corporate banking areas. Previously, he served as the firm's president, as well as COO, and currently he is the chairman and CEO of PNC. Um, though he is very involved in his professional life, he is also very active through his personal and community involvement here in Pittsburgh. And he has been, he's done very excellent things and he has received numerous awards, including Pittsburgher of the Year by Pittsburgh Magazine, as well as Banker of the Year. And through his leadership, PNC has actually grown into the nation's sixth largest deposit holder. Also, he is very involved here at Carnegie Mellon University. Not only is he chair for the CMU Presidential Search Committee, he is also a CMU Life Trustee, as well as sitting on the Board of Advisors for the Tepper School of Business. Through the PNC Foundation, the um, PNC Professorship of Finance has been established here at the Tepper School of Business just last year, and our Professor Vernon Hollifield currently holds that position. So without further delay, I want to introduce to all of you this afternoon, uh, Mr. Jim Rohr. Please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thank you. Wow, that's quite a... Thank you very much. That's, that's quite an introduction. That's a, I don't even remember most of that stuff. <laughs> that happens with age from time to time. You, you forget. It's great to be here. It's an honor to be here as a, as a speaker of the W.L. Mellon uh, Speaker Series. Uh, obviously, uh, W.L. Mellon was quite a fellow and, uh, and was quite accomplished. And the fact that there's a speaker series named after him is, is really terrific. And it's a privilege to be here. It's also a little intimidating being in front of the Dean Damon himself uh, and, and uh, obviously a number of other professors. So I, I, can't, uh, I can't bend the truth too much, uh, too much today. Uh, what's the expectation for today? If I could get three, three questions, if three people could raise their hands and tell me, what would you expect, or what would you want to hear about from uh, some heavy set guy, banker these days? Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Catherine Mollett, I'm a first generation. Um, I'd like to hear about how PNC has invested in the Tepper School of Business and how it's helped the regulatory challenges. Okay, thank you. That's not really a problem. It's pretty easy. Anyway, <laughs> yes, sir. Sure. By the way, any CEOs at 40,000 feet, you don't need them. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff happens on the ground. Third question? Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, great. That's a very diverse set of questions. We'll try to we'll try to address a few of those. Uh, but but first, let me make a comment about uh, about the world we live in today, and maybe talk about Carnegie Mellon. Uh, six years ago, there was no Skype. Uh, six years ago, there was no Facebook. Six years ago. Blockbuster Video was the number one entertainment company in the United States. 
And six years ago, Apple was rumored to be on the verge of bankruptcy. A lot of change since then. A lot of change. And the pace of change is just accelerating. And there's almost nothing accelerating as, as, as rapidly as just the pace of change. And I would say that, you know, if, if I were back to your question about careers, I think one of the things that, you, that is very exciting about being a young person today is the pace of change. Because if you want to get ahead, what you want to do is you want to get in some business that's changing. I mean, you don't want to really be the chief operating officer of the local cement company, right? Unless you own it. That's be not, that's probably not bad, but if you don't own it, I mean, there's not a lot of change. You want something that's changing. You want to change something, something that's changing rapidly, where there's an opportunity for you to, for you to, for you to succeed and be successful, however you want to define yourself. And change is something that's that's going, it's moving very rapidly. We'll talk about it a little bit in, bank, in the banking industry. But one of the things that's amazing about Carnegie Mellon is the pace of change at Carnegie Mellon. And you think about how Carnegie Mellon uh, is positioned. Um, in the world today, uh, it is really at the vortex of a lot of things that are changing, whether it's computer science or software or, uh, or you know, finance uh, and, and <coughs> computational finance, a number of things. The big data, you know, this is where you come to big data, and it's also one of the wonderful places for fine art. So it's really one of the great places to, to go to school because you're in the middle of all of this change. We at, at PNC uh, were thinking about how do we think about our business going forward in this pace of change? How do we understand our customers uh, as well as we might? How do we understand the na nature of changing our customers and, uh, and where, how we might change our products and services in order to anticipate uh, their needs? Now, where's Tom Coons? Tom Coons is in the back. The creator, how many people have a virtual wallet account? Everybody raise their hand. You ought to have a virtual wallet. The creator of virtual wallets, a fellow named Tom Kunz. And when Tom Kunz, when we, we said at the time, we said, how, how do we figure out you know, what customers might, might want? And, and we had a consultant, and Tom and some others uh, from PNC went and, and met with a whole series of Generation Y kind of people and talked to them about how they might view how they manage their money, how they use their money, what kind of products, what we think about. And, uh, and really out of that came the creation of Virtual Wallet. Now there's a million, 200,000 Virtual Wallet accounts. It's the number one online account in America. And it's, you know, and it's fun, actually. It's, it's fun, it helps you budget, and you can punch the pig and all the stuff that Tom invented and many others. But, it's, but how did we do that? We did that by doing research. Uh, but it's only scratching the surface when you think about big data. And so one of the things we wanted to do was figure out how we might continue innovating because it's, it, is about, it, it is about innovation and the pace of change and innovation. And when we thought about how we might do that in a collaborative way with someone who might actually know something about it and who might have the resources and the personnel and the data to be able to help us with this, there's really no university like Carnegie Mellon to be able to do that. When you think about a university that has big data, that is innovative, has students that are innovatively minded, does a lot of research, has a great finance and great business school, now ranked number 11 in the country, where else would you want to go than to Carnegie Mellon? The other thing is that you would want to go to a university that has a collaborative nature, where people actually work across the campus on things, because this is not a, no offense, it's not a, it's not a derivative, you know, you just don't calculate it out, it comes out. It's taking data, trends, behavioral science, and do research in a way that would actually lead you to be able to anticipate customer change and build products and services for that. And so that's why today that we're announcing uh, the PNC Center with, uh, for Innovation at Carnegie Mellon. It's a commitment that we have. We're going to be paying. We're going to be investing with you and working together with you a million one hundred thousand dollars a year for the next five years to include people in this kind of research to be able to bring together the talents at Carnegie Mellon and the people at PNC to work on projects that actually just anticipate customers' needs. 
and, and follow the trends that we have in the country. And so we're very, very excited about it. Bob, it's, it's just wonderful. I just can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for what you're going to do. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. So anyway, before we get to those questions, that's the, that's, that's the really exciting piece that it's over now, so you don't have to worry about any other, any other tests. But I, I think one of the interesting things about change, though, is, and we'll just talk about change then open it up for questions, is as we look at every business, and, and change, innovation comes out of you know, Facebook or Apple or Google, and they are unbelievable. I mean, who, who could have imagined, who could have imagined five years ago what you could do with your cell phone? Uh, not the fact, never mind the fact that somebody can find you wherever you are with your cell phone if you don't turn it off. But anyway, I mean, it's just an unbelievable, unbelievable asset. And when we, when I think back in my career, you know, 40 years ago we had a discussion. That was night. That was, it was night in the night early 1980s. We had a discussion as to whether we would buy an ATM machine. I don't laugh. You're laughing. <laughs> the guy that ran the retail business said he'll never buy one. He said, who would ever walk up and talk to a machine instead of going into the branch and actually talking to a teller? And so he said no. We had further discussions, and we bought two. What the hell are you going to do with two? Anyways, we had two. And he was right. Nobody used them much. And you think about it today, and the, and the, brand, and the ATM machines, you can do virtually anything you want with an ATM machine. And actually, if you think fast enough, and maybe this collaborative institute would, uh, center would actually come up with this, we won't need them anymore. Because the pace of change is, the pace of change is, is so amazing. Uh, we had check writing grew 6% a year for 1,000 years, or maybe 2,000 or 5,000, I don't know, it's a long time, until it didn't. And then it fell 10% and 15% to the extent that the Federal Reserve <clears throat> in Cleveland was identified as the last Federal Reserve that would do check processing. And when they closed the Cincinnati, when they closed the St. Louis check processing operation, before they could get the machines from St. Louis to Cleveland, the volume had gone down enough so that they didn't need them. It's amazing. And so it's, it's fallen off precipitously. Online banking growing at 20% uh, a year and bill payment growing at 20. And now we have this thing called the cell phone. And we now have over 10,000 items a day that are deposited with checks, just with a pic, taking a picture with a cell phone, making a deposit. Now, I ask how fast that's growing. Tom tells me it's growing, at, he goes, he says, it's growing at 20% a month. That means he has no idea how fast it's growing. <laughs> he has no idea. It's going through the roof. Now, stop and think about it for a second. We have never told anybody, we have never incented anybody to do it. Never incented anybody to do it. Costs us, how about this? Cost the county, this is, this is right up your alley. Costs us $3.94 to process an item in a teller window. You can probably argue that number, but it's a relative number. It costs us 60 cents to process an item with a cell phone. My guess is the teller cost is low and the, and the, and the telephone cost is high. But in any event, it's going to go up. They'll go opposite directions as the volumes continue to move. And that's just one product. Now you have questions about whether you sell, use your cell phone to make a payment. Now that means all the retailers have to put in different equipment, you know, rather than use a swipe card, you use the cell phone. But that's coming. It's, and there's just a lot of change taking place. How it, where it goes and how it ends, I don't know. But that's one of the things, uh, that's one of the things that I think we're most, most interested in about this institute is to think about our retail bank business, right banking business and how we develop products and how we market to you. And, and, and uh, also, as you know, the, the internet, what, what age group uses the internet the most? People under 30, right? 
use the internet the most. What age group uses the internet the second most? Pardon? People over 70. People over 70. They have time. <laughs> and they talk to you. You know, they can't call you on the phone. You don't have time to talk to your grandparents, right? And they send you emails and stuff. It's, it's fabulous. I mean, they, 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 the grandparents never used to talk to grandchildren ever. Now they get to communicate with grandchildren in a way that they never did before. So they can email and text and all this kind of stuff. And so if you talk about, talk to car companies, car companies, all the research is done online. Who buys a car in the, in the, car, in the, in the, in the dealership anymore? Technically, you do. But that's not where all the research is done. And if, if they talk about people over 70, they research the cars totally online. They call three dealers for a price and buy the car. So the old story that you remember, Bob, where you go to the dealer and the guy lies to you and you're back and forth and the number changes all the time. And basically what happened was the worst experience, and this is a fairly young crowd, the worst experience in life was buying a car. Because the salesperson would give you about 12 different numbers. You finally buy the car and you'd walk out of there figuring, you know, you got screwed somehow. No matter what the number was, you felt like it was a, such a bad experience. Chester Spatz went back there, he's not a guest. It was the worst experience you ever had. You had a new car, you know you paid too much. And they'd, they'd go behind the door, you know, they go behind the door like there was some magic behind the door and they'd come out with another number. They, anyway, uh, that doesn't happen anymore because of the online experience is, is so terrific. And so one of the reasons we're very excited about the, uh, about, the, about the center here is that this university really does have the talent, the data, the research orientation, and the collaboration to be able to actually really take a look at our business and our customers and really kind of help us, help us through that. And that's true for all of our businesses too. I think when we think about private banking, we now manage about a quarter of a trillion dollars. We're the third largest private bank, I think, in America. And our customer growth is phenomenal, growing at 20 to 30% a year, which is really terrific. But how do we, how do we really, I mean, we're a neophyte. By the way, that's such a splintered business. The largest private bank in America has a less than 4% market share. That's Merrill Lynch. And so it's such a fragmented business. But like a lot of things, technology will bring that business together. And, uh, and we really have to understand how we really understand our customers and our customers' needs, preferences, and build products and services and delivery systems to, uh, to really make it work for them. And I think that's, uh, that is right in line. So the, the banking business, even though you think about, uh, you think about Google and Facebook as, as being great, uh, innovative companies, they really are, but every industry today has to innovate. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I love, the, the idea of Carnegie Mellon, you know, Andrew Carnegie was a steel guy, right? So he was a big steel guy. Actually, he was an innovator. He was the single biggest innovator of his time. Andrew Carnegie was a very tough guy, negotiated with, there's all these history about, about how he negotiated diff difficultly with the unions and all the rest. Actually, he innovated by, by integrating his companies together in a way that gave him a cost benefit. That was the first thing he did. But the thing that really changed Andrew Carnegie's fortune was that he found a person, the first fellow was in St. Louis, who actually put steel in the middle of uh, iron bridges. And so what happened was he, it, it, it would dramatically increase the strength of the bridge, dramatically reduce the, the content in the bridge. You could build the bridge much more rapidly and so what he did is he took the Homestead Works, which is across the river, built structural steel. He created a company called the American Bridge Company, which is what Ambridge is named after. So he had the structural steel, he had the design, he had the construction company, and he went to the railroads who were expanding dramatically at the time and said, I can build you a bridge faster, cheaper, and stronger. They said, thank you very much, deal's done, boom. And Andrew Carnegie went from a big company to a dominant player, all because of technology. And so when you think back at the history of Carnegie Mellon, and, 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 you know, not everybody writes that report about Carnegie, that he was you know, an integrator kind of a guy. 
he was also an innovator in, in a great way. And so it's uh, the history of Carnegie Mellon uh, dates all the way dates all the way back to there. So I think uh, that's really the story about <clears throat> about the pace of change and where we're going in the banking business. It's changing a lot. Uh, and I think when you look at uh, when you look at the branch network, 85% of our customers and prospects say they want to see a multi-channel distribution system. So they want to see a branch. They just don't go every every week or you know every day or or even once a month. As a matter of fact, interestingly, 85% of all of our virtual wallet accounts were opened in a branch. So how many people have accounts? Virtual wallet accounts, how many open them in a branch? No, but I'm on a branch. You ever been back in a branch since? Maybe once, but not very often. But what, that's, that's really what happens, and so people do want, that, uh, do want that capability to go to a branch. But we'll be seeing fewer branches, and we'll be seeing more online traffic and more differentiated uh, pieces, and it's a big deal for us cost-wise. Because with the industry, with the industry having such low interest rates, deposits aren't worth very much anymore. We just can't really invest deposits and make much money with the interest rate. Uh, so we still have almost half of our ex total expense at PNC, almost $5 billion a year is tied up in our retail distribution system. When you consider the branches, which is about $3 billion, and then operations, which is another two. So there's a lot of money tied up in that. And so there's a tremendous amount of efficiency that will come out over time. But with that, let me open it up to questions. I hopefully touched a couple of your questions. We've got, uh, we've got some time. What kind of things would you want to ask a sitting CEO? Uh, finance, the first year MBA students. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm Tanda. I'm a first year MBA student. Uh, what kind of career advice would you give us uh, in order to become as successful as you are? <laughs> it, it, your, what kind of advice would I give you for? For what, in what's, I missed the last half of that sentence. That's successful. I'll tell you that, you know, sometimes the trainees ask me, what is the, tell me what, this will really offend you, this will really offend you. They said, what do you remember from school? What professor told you something? And I had this finance guy, he handed out, he handed out his tax return in 1972. He made a million dollars a year. He owned a bunch of auto companies. He was a big counselor at GE, and he had a cigar about this long. This is at Ohio State. He used to. He was really pompous. They're not like that anymore, I don't think. But he, this, this guy was really arrogant, you know. And he he blow the smoke, and it was a night class, and uh, and he told us. Um, he said, "Now, if if anybody misses two classes, I don't care if your mother dies, car breaks down." You miss two classes, you flunk. That's all there is to it. I'm going to flunk you. Well, we were graduate students. This was a night class. How could this possibly be? We were graduate students. You missed two classes. I mean, even if your mother died. So we all ran out like you do and found out it was true. If you missed two court, two classes, you flunked. So you'd have to drop the course or something. So about halfway through the class, he said, well, you've all found this out, and you want to know why. He says, it's all about being successful. And he said, when you get out in the real world, if you don't show up, you never get the order. So it takes good health to be successful. And you got to show up. You know, now after 40 years, I've looked back and I've seen some really bright people be successful. And I've seen some not so bright people be successful. But I've never seen a lazy person be successful. And I think hard work, without a doubt, across the board, is the single biggest determinant, determinant of success. You can be lucky, sitting in my chair. Any CEO says he wasn't lucky or she wasn't lucky when they got there, don't even listen to them. You gotta be lucky. I mean, that's just a fact, you gotta have luck. But across the board, you gotta work hard. You really have to work hard. You have to manage your risks, you have to manage relationships. And, uh, and I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, but hard, hard work is the single, and, and that's what you learned at Carnegie Mellon. That's what you learned at Carnegie Mellon. We had this meeting where we were talking about, we were talking about, nice enough to mention, I'm, I'm on the search committee here for the next uh, president, and, and we were talking about the culture of Carnegie Mellon, because we want to make sure that the, the culture of Carnegie Mellon is, 
uh, is it better than the next president? And uh, somebody kind of said, well, you know, we have a habit of working our students really hard. He said, well, that's part of the culture. And that's why they're successful, and that's why this degree is, is so valuable, because that's part of the, that, that's part of the culture of the, of the institution. Other question? Yes, sir. Hi, my name's Reed. I'm a second year. Uh, second year? Well, yeah. It's a privilege to have you here. It's great. So. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're on uh, your way out. I mean, you know, this is... This is it. <laughs> uh, can you talk about, I guess, the fiscal cliff and kind of how it's impacted your thought process at PNC and also why you feel that not much is getting done in Washington these days? Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> um... Let me just tell you, as young people who have to, this is a finance class, right? So you kind of have to balance your books at some point. Um, this idea of $16.5 trillion worth of debt is really a bad idea. Um, I've made a speech uh, the Council for Economic Development where I told a group of people my age that we have failed the next generation. I believe that. Uh, our generation did not inherit $16.5 trillion worth of debt. And our generation did not inherit a 60%, and that's the highest number you can find, high school graduation rate. And so what we're doing is we're passing on to the next generation, which is moving into rapidly a global economy. We're, giving, we're handing off to them $16.5 trillion worth of debt. We're handing off to them a trillion and a half dollar embedded deficit with zero interest rates. Interest rates go up 200 basis points, and the answer is the deficit goes to two trillion. Annually, we get downgraded by all the rating agencies, and we are no longer the global currency, and interest rates go up further. And we don't pay attention to this. And, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, you can... It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. It really doesn't. You gotta look at this and say, we haven't had a budget for four years. We've increased spending by a trillion dollars in four years, and we're going north. It doesn't matter to me. It should matter to you. And the idea that the concept that the rich people will pay for it is humorous. Because it's not sixteen and a half trillion dollars with the de with the debt, the state of California has their own debt. The rich people have to pay for that too. And every municipality has a broken pension fund, and the rich people have to pay for that too. Every state, Pennsylvania, has their own deficit and their own debt. And the rich people have to pay for that too. So if you're going to say the rich people are going to pay for it, don't use $16.5 trillion. Add all the other debt. And so I think, uh, you know, I think, I think this fiscal cliff thing, you know, is we just passed it off and said it's not a big deal and we're going to pass off the debt ceiling. But if you look at Greece, that's what's going to happen unless we do something about it. By the way, it didn't take us 15 minutes to get here. We didn't get here in the last four years. We've been doing this for a period of time, but the pace of change is increasing. Now, if we do something about it now and start taking it down before interest rates increase, <clears throat> we'll be all right. But if we don't, we won't be. And so it's, it, it, it depends on how much pain you want to take. You want to take a little bit of pain now and start to modulate the problem, or do you just want to wait until... You know, it all happens at once, which is never much fun. But if you're a politician, you know, somebody else, you, you'll be out of office by the time that happens. So don't worry about it. I think it's, I think it's a very serious issue, and, and we're not, we, we as a country are paying attention. It's a shame. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is John Joe. I'm a first year MSC student. And um, may I just ask a simple question? When you were at our age, what like, how did you find what you want to do? When I was your age, <clears throat> when I was your age, I was, uh, when I got out of Notre Dame, I had an arts and letters degree, so I couldn't get a job. 
I had no money. <clears throat> Ohio State told me that if I taught statistics, they would pay me $300 a month and give me free tuition. So <clears throat> when I arrived in, uh, in Columbus, Ohio, I had no money, a wife, and uh, $300 a month taught statistics. And so that's you know, that was the position I was in. When I, got, when I got a job offer, I needed the job. And I got four job offers, and I liked the people, I'll never forget it, I liked the people at what was Pittsburgh National Bank at the time. It was a very small bank, and uh, I liked the people. The people said, if you work hard, we'll reward you for it. That was the, that was the thing that differentiated. <clears throat> I could have gone to work for Procter & Gamble. I could have gone to work for uh, you know, B.F. Goodrich. I could have gone to work for Ogilvy & Mather in New York. Uh, but I liked the people, and, uh, and it's worked out pretty good. So I, would, I, wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't change anything about it. It worked out. I was a very, very lucky person. But, uh, you know, I, I guess when I was, you know, I needed a job. I, I, needed, a, I needed a salary is what I needed. So, you know, it's, uh, I just needed somebody to send me a letter and said they'd pay me to, pay me to come to work for them, which is, which is exactly what I, what I did. So I, I think the, quite the comments I made earlier, I didn't know. I, I didn't have the options that you'll have here at Carnegie Mellon. And, uh, and so the idea of, of interviewing companies that, one, interest you, the business interests you, and then secondly, that have change in them. And then I would make sure that I go to a leader in that change. Because who knows whether you spend, I mean, the idea, I mean, I've spent 40 years at this company. That like never happens, right? I mean, it's, you know, 15 minutes is a lot these days. <laughs> So what you want to do coming out of school is you tell you get all the experience that you have at the at the university, and then what you want to do is 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 work someplace where that actually meets the road, where where you can take what you learn and actually experience it with a, with a with a company that's successful, because you know the idea that you're going to take your academic experience and go help somebody who's failing, that's a hard putt. I mean that's just hard to do. So I would. Uh, I would say that your first step out would be to go go put your skills to work with a very successful company in an industry that in an industry that you're interested in and one that has change. Yes, ma'am. My name is Michelle. I'm a first year MBA student. Thank you very much for your support of the school. What one innovation excites you the most? Oh, my cell phone. It's unbelievable. I just got an iPhone. I didn't have one before. It's, it's, it's so much fun. I mean, it is so much fun. It really is. And I, you know, and I have to study up on Apple tonight. I'm on Squawk Box tomorrow morning, and so we have the we have the, the pre-Apple day tomorrow. So I got to learn all about gadgets tomorrow. It's going to be fun. Tomorrow is a gadget day at, at Squawk Box. So between eight and nine, we're going to have a bunch of gadget. Yeah, one of the cool, coolest gadgets for for. Uh, you know, 2013 plus the Apple view. So it should be a, it should be a fun show, and we'll have the CEO of CSX who's going to tell us about trains. I mean, how can you beat that? I mean, for the, <laughs> I like trains. So uh, no, I, I, I you know there's just so many things that are that are so much fun, and uh, the, the things you can view on your iPad. I mean, I I think of myself. You know, I'm not a technology adopter. But in the last 18 months, between my cell phone and my iPad, I've changed my life, in, in, a, in a way. And it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's just, it's really fun, I think. Yeah, sir, in the back with the beard. Um, hi, my name is Costantinos. I'm a second year. Uh, you said that you spent 40 years um, in PNC. Um, do you, do you see, well, career-wise, do you see that this has been changing? What would your advice be to us to like stick with a company for our entire career, uh, consider shifting from one company to another every five or ten years? Uh, how do you see the climbing, you know, the corporate ladder within the same firm for one's entire career, um, you know, progressing, uh, you know, in in our days? I don't think it happens much anymore. Uh, Tom Kuntz, you, 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 Tom's been with us for a while. I don't think it happens that much anymore, from what I could tell. But I was very fortunate in a way that my job changed a lot. Um, 
maybe you go way, way back years ago, I was going to go open the New York office. We never had an offsite. I was going to open the New York office. And, uh, and I got promoted into a different job just before that happened. So we sent a guy to open the New York office. You know, he went broke and got divorced and his life went in the tank. <laughs> it could have been me. I mean, it could have been, it could have been me. <laughs> probably would have been, you know, I mean, probably would have been. I, and I was, I was fortunate that way, but I, I was given a, a different job. And, and, and I guess my job progressed in a way that uh, I was given a number of opportunities along the way. So the one, so the one I got bored, before I got bored or just when I was getting bored, I got a different opportunity, which was good. And then the whole industry changed. Now, if I would think back and say, okay, now I'm still doing the same old stuff, and we get to 1983, uh, we, we merged with the Provident Bank. We bought the Provident Bank in Philadelphia, made a $10 billion bank, $10 billion bank. And that was the largest banking transaction in the history of the United States of America, it's 1983. Well, then we started, we started consolidating banks across the state and then across multi-states and businesses changed and, and it gave me a whole series of growth opportunities that if the company had just been the same and had been growing organically, I probably would have left. Yeah, I, I probably would have been bored and left, but who knows. But I think one of the things is that if you're in a company where you continue to progress and be challenged and learn, I mean, that, when I think back, that's what I was doing. I was being challenged and learned and enjoyed what I was doing and enjoyed the people I was working with. So as long as that happened, as long as there was opportunity to grow, I stayed. Had that not been the case for whatever reason, I probably would have done something else. So it was a, I think it was, a, it was unique in, in terms of how the industry changed at the same time that the company changed. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi, I'm Nick. I'm a first year MBA student. Um, how do you focus your philanthropic work? Um, what's your philosophy behind that, both personally and then also in your leadership at um, the bank? Well, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, well, personally, I give to the places I care about. So, you know, beer, wells, wherever, you know. Um, well, we had an interesting experience at PNC. In the early 2000s, very early in my career as the CEO, I asked the question, uh, if we, and PNC has always been very philanthropic. We've been named the number one uh, most philanthropic company in the United States of America by the New York Committee to Encourage Corporate Philanthropy. Reading is fundamental. There's a whole series of things we've won um, uh, about being charitable. And the first thing I signed when I came to work for Pittsburgh National Bank was my United Way pledge. Uh, there were two pieces of paper. One was the saying that you signed as an employee to say you weren't going to steal anything. The page you signed before that was your United Way pledge. The pledge was on top. So we were always giving back from, from my very first day. Uh, you know, giving back to the community was important. So it was part of the culture of the company for years and years. And in the early 2000s, we asked the question, uh, a la Carnegie Mellon, if you focus, right, could you be more productive? And so we, asked, we said, if we focused our giving in certain areas, could we be more successful? Could we be more productive with our money? And the answer, according to all the professors, was, you know, that'd be right. You know, but how would you do that? Well, first of all, you can't take money away from charities, right? Because then you get negative reaction, and that's bad. You're not trying to get negative reaction. You're trying to get positive reaction. So we asked our employees what they might be interested in, and they said, children and education. So there's a woman named Eva Bloom. You've met Eva many times. She's the queen of Grow Up Great, as we call her. Uh, she's the head of our foundation. And so uh, we did a study. And actually, there are two cases in the Harvard Business School about Grow Up Great. And we actually did a study, and it showed there were other studies, a University of Chicago study coming out, some work that was done here at Carnegie Mellon, that showed that, that the average underserved child shows up in kindergarten with a 50, 25 to 50% de deficiency in vocabulary when they get to kindergarten. From that point forward, the gap between themselves and the average child grows. By the time the kid gets to fifth grade, they're making life decisions. By the way, you're getting A's and B's, I'm getting D's and F's, all this stuff about going to graduate school, even going to high school really isn't very attractive to my D's and F's, so I'm going someplace else. 
The studies show that for every dollar that we spend, that we invest in early childhood education, the society gets between $17 and $27 back in lower incarceration, rehabilitation, and welfare payments. Third grade literacy is the number one best forecaster for the need for jail cells 20 years later. And so what we did is we put together what is now a $350 million commitment to early childhood education, number one program in America. And uh, we've actually got the state to put up some money in addition to that, which was nice. Pennsylvania's in. Number We now have 30-something uh, states that are in the early childhood education business. Uh, over 25% of our employees volunteer their time in early childhood centers across all of PNC. And we have a number of partners like Sesame Street, PBS Kids, and things like that that are our partners that really helped us. So uh, we are as philanthropic in the other areas as we always were, but we put uh, this additional focus on early childhood education. It's been very rewarding to the company. And here's a business case for you. People who I, customers who identify with early childhood education and grow up great have a 90% probability of being committed customers, which means they do more business with us and they're more loyal. And employees who identify with grow up great have a 90% probability of being committed employees, which means they have higher performance, lower turnover, less training, blah, 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 blah. So it's good business for grow up great as well. So it's a, it's a great thing for us, that philanthropy. Philanthropy has been great for us. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, thanks. My name is Mark. I'm a senior in the undergrad program. I'm just curious how it got. You're undergrad? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Are you intimidated with all this stuff here? I mean, wait a second year man over here. A little bit. Um, second year man in the bank. I'm just curious how a guy from Cleveland lasts in Pittsburgh for 40 years, you know? Oh, that was, that was and rough. Are you, and are you a Browns fan? Well, I was. Okay. So I come to Pittsburgh. My wife and I were Browns fans. We come to Pittsburgh in 1972. As of 72, by the way, 72, up until 1972, the Steelers were the losingest football team in the NFL. The history of the NFL. And we come, so we come to town. By the way, a good friend of mine, Dan Rooney, he became president of the Steelers that year. So the old man, Art, was the run of the Steelers prior to that. And the team was terrible. <laughs> the Browns had been really good in those days while I grew up. And so I get to Pittsburgh. My wife and I get to Pittsburgh. We should, they say, well, you know, um, this is a great rivalry. We said, well, this is not a rivalry. We already beat you. We always beat you. You're terrible. <laughs> well... And the Steelers, of course, have the dynasty. We have to cheer for the Browns while the Steelers win four Super Bowls and beat us like rented mules. And uh, that was a very bad experience. And then our Modell moved the team to Baltimore. So we could then drop the Browns affiliation. We've been Steelers fans ever since. That was a, that was a good thing. That was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> the early days was tough. We'd go to Cleveland for the Browns game and come back and there'd be stuff on our garage doors, you know, it wasn't, wasn't pretty. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. Uh, Ryan Burns, second year MBA. Uh, I'm actually wondering if you can discuss your management style, how it's evolved over time, and uh, some of the key tactics that you use uh, as it relates to leadership. Well, you know, one of the interesting things about leadership, uh, that's a very tough question to ask the individual, right? Because I'm just who I am. I'm the same guy I was 42 years ago. You know, <clears throat> wrong. Uh, you got to ask somebody else how he's involved. But I'll tell you the most interesting thing that I've learned is that when you first get a job, you know, you, you want a job where your performance can be recognized, right? And so you, you go to a company where you're, the, you know, you're doing whatever you're doing, and you're you're growing, and you're getting ahead, and you're getting promoted. And, and then you're in charge of a group of people, you know, and, 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 but you personally can still move the numbers, right? You can do something. You can think of cost-saving things. You can generate more customers. You can do whatever you're, you know, and you can move the numbers for the group. And then there comes a point where you can't. And what happens there for most of our employees is they go back and they try to do what they've always done to get ahead. They try to work harder. 
They already work more hours. That's how you, I mean, they're already doing that. They're already working hard. Uh, and so they try and work harder because that's what's been successful for them. And what, what they don't realize is that that's not the game anymore. They, their success at that point is totally dependent upon the success of the people they're working with and they're leading. And they have to become fully invested in those people to make them better, to make them successful. Because that's the only way that the group is going to move in a way that, that he or she could be successful. And I think that's the most interesting thing for me uh, has been, and, and, and maybe it's back to his question in the back, I, you know, I've had the opportunity to, you know, when, when we bought the Philadelphia bank, I had to go spend a couple days a week in Philadelphia, mostly because the bank went broke. But anyways, you know, and I got, I had to, I had to be different because Philadelphia and Pittsburgh in, in 1984 was as different as, you know, Saskatchewan and, you know, and uh, Cleveland. I mean, they, they hated each other and didn't want to work together. And so, uh, you know, I think it it caused me to rethink how I worked with a different group of people. But you, but but you have to be invested in them, and that and that to me was is the leadership thing that was most important. Is that once you find out that you want, they find out that you want them to win, they'll follow you. If they feel that all you want to do is use them to get yourself ahead and leave them behind. Then, then that's a that's a tough part, and that's true whether it's uh, whether it's a, sm a small group or a larger group. Uh, the, the larger group wants to be successful as well, and so they want a leader that wants them to be successful, not just himself or herself. And we have time for one more question. Oh, last question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, James. Okay, thank you. I am a PhD student, actually. Maybe. Oh, well, no, the best for last. <laughs> no, <very> I'm intimidated. <laughs> Please don't. Okay, I actually have a question related to the thing that you mentioned that you like your new iPhone and you like innovation. So I'm doing some research regarding mobile payment, and I would like to sh uh, listen to your view about what's the future about the mobile industry, the mobile payment industry, and what kind of role PNC is going to play in this new game. Thank you very much. Oh. Let me, let me go back, uh, let me try and tie together some of the other questions that we had at the beginning. I think we talked about, he asked about some career advice. We had a question over here about regulatory change. And then we had, we had a question over here about risk. And I think that all comes together in the payments business. Payments business is changing very, very rapidly. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, 20% online bill pay, we get this thing grow 20% a month, according to Tom. Uh, you know, that's just going through the roof. I think, I think the payments business is going to change rapidly. Also, we have new players. Okay, so we have Walmart that comes in and does a deal with a $1 billion bank and is sending a trillion dollars worth of payments through the $1 billion bank. It's a bad joke. I mean, you know, if, if something happens to that bank, it's going to disrupt the stream of payments. It'll be massive. But it's outside of the regulatory environment because <clears throat> in the Dodd-Frank bill, there was this little Walmart clause that allowed third-party third party agreements to be put together like this. And so there's two or three of those. And so there's a lot of different things that are going on in the payments business. And you know the regulators really, they understand it, but it's what they refer to it as shadow banking, and they don't want to deal with it. <clears throat> they don't want to deal with it because it, it uh, they're concerned about it. I sit on the Federal Advisory Council with the Fed, and we meet quarterly, and we talk about this, and they're not sure what to do about it. And the fact that we have fragmented regulators makes jurisdiction questionable. Makes jurisdiction questionable. And now we have all these, uh, these DDoS attacks, right, where you know, all your online service has been slowed. Now, we haven't crashed as yet, so they keep coming back at us. We've now been attacked more than anybody else because we haven't crashed. Well, maybe I talked to some other CEOs. I think we're just going to crash. Oh, then, then, we'll, then we'll come back. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's not, a, hey, he might be right. I don't know. That's not our strategy so far. Uh, but nobody's gotten a hold of any account information yet. 
to my knowledge, at any bank. But these people aren't kidding around. These people aren't kidding around. And so all this changing technology, uh, I think, Tom, we, we had uh, 96 gigabytes a second. This is, a, I mean, this is not for the faint of heart. And so sometimes you talk about banks too big to fail. In the new world we're going into, there might be a bank that's not big enough to protect itself. We're running a new world in this technology space, and, and part of this thing about the center, uh, and obviously the, 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 all the, the capabilities that are here at Carnegie Mellon, we're not kidding ourselves, this center is also going to be thinking about how we protect ourselves because security is the most important thing. When you talk to the government, and I don't quote anybody, uh, is, is a, the one quote says, we really don't care about an army coming across the Rio Grande anymore. Uh, and actually, we're not particularly worried about missiles. But we are worried about the safety, the cyber safety of the financial system, and we're, we're concerned about the... Uh, uh, the power grid, because those two things, we are, we are the most interdependent country in the world. We, you know, food, everything that we do is interdependent. And if you shut down the power grid, uh, or if you interfere with the banking system, it changes a lot. Think about, in our branches, we now have thousands of dollars. I get it, I, I know we're, we're running out of time, I guess. I, I saw I saw it. It wasn't our branch, but I saw a, a, a armored truck pull up in front of a, somebody else's branch the other day. I had this is terrible. This old guy gets out of the car. He looked like me, and, and, and he, he he's all by himself. And he goes in the back of the truck and opens the truck. It goes in the truck. It gets out a bag of money and leaves the back door of the truck open and goes into this bank branch and gives them the back of the money, comes back out and closes the truck and drives away. Nobody robbed him. You know why? There's not enough money there to worry about. <laughs> in the old days, you know, all the old movies, that was a big deal. There isn't enough money in the branch anymore to matter. And so if you think about shutting the power grid down, or the banking system down so that ATM machines and swipe cards don't work. There's not enough, you can't go in the bank and get enough cash to operate this economy. Because we, all the cash centers have been shut down. And the Federal Reserve has shut down all their cash centers mostly. So it's a, it's a different economy. We have to worry about that. And I think those things, whether it's regulation, and regulation's changing a lot. I mean, we spend a lot of time in regulation. It's massive change. Uh, but, uh, but, but I think regulation and technology will have a lot to do with that, what happens with the payments industry. And I will tell you, we had Paul Kaminsky here the other day. Paul's the chairman of RAND, and he's on a whole, so he, he was one of the original uh, developers of the Stealth Fighter. Uh, he's on all of these secret you know, committees. He was on television the other morning. We had dinner with him the night before. His prediction was that there would be a Pearl Harbor cyber attack before our government does something about it. Because if I think about Dodd-Frank, there's a lot of good things about Dodd-Frank. We really needed a systemic regulator. We needed people to look at non-banks. I mean, there's a lot of good things about Dodd-Frank. The one thing that's not good about Dodd-Frank is that there are five to seven different institutions, jealous institutions, trying to implement it. And that makes it very difficult, very, very inefficient, and in what could be very ineffective. But I think, quite frankly, when I look at, at where we're going, the country's doing better and better. Uh, we had 2% growth last year. We'll probably do better this year. We've got, we'll have a housing business this year. We'll have a, really, a real housing business next year. And I think from an employment point of view, which is real important, I think, uh, I think the demand for Carnegie Mellon students has never been higher, and it's never been higher from PNC. So come join us. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>
uh, thank you and thank PNC for the very generous gift uh, and the support that you're giving us that will allow us to establish this uh, new uh, PNC Center for um, Financial Services Innovation. Uh, as you said before, this is a university that um, is outstanding in many areas, and it really is a, a university or collaboration in interdisciplinary work uh, very well. And this center, which is going to be a university-wide center, will um, it, it be able allow us to exploit our expertise across computer science, engineering, business, public policy, uh, so it's an exciting opportunity for us, and I, I want to thank you again for the support that you personally have given us, and PNC as well. You, you certainly have set the bar high for any future W.L. Mellon speaker. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. It's an honor to be part of this. Thank you very honor much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.